an advocate for intelligent design say, yes, if you stretch the definition of science to include intelligent design, you know what else fits in that strike zone? Astrology. And I would add, so does mysticism, pyramid power, New Age spiritualism, and Wiccan teaching or witchcraft. Now, I'm sure this is all really fine stuff, but one of the things that it's not is science, and that's the point. And I think the relevant question that anyone who advocates intelligent design has to answer is you want to open the science classroom up to intelligent design. You will also open it to astrology and a whole host of pseudoscientific beliefs. Is this really what you want to do in, there, in terms of in, uh, reforming science teaching? And I should point out, this was not an accidental statement by Dr. B. He, he said it in his deposition. Then he said it in trial. The attorney asked him again, are you sure? Do you really mean that? And he went on and he said yes, and he thought astrology had made some very fundamental contributions to science. So in any event, um, that's where we are with this. Now, one of the questions that I wanted to ask for, uh, in front of this audience tonight is whether or not we can learn anything from the Dover trial. Um, I, I've only been in two trials in my life. Actually, I guess I've been in three because I served in a jury for another trial. But it's really different being on the witness stand and being cross-examined and seeing all these people there. And I have to say it was a very exhilarating experience. It was uh, not unlike a graduate seminar when you're surrounded by really sharp grad students who are going to push you up against the wall and see if you really know the stuff. So what I want to tell you basically, in a sense, is what I learned at the trial, and I think what most of it can take away from it. Here's the first thing that I saw at the trial. It's the reason for the title of my talk tonight. What we saw was the literal collapse of intelligent design as a scientific theory. Now, let me try to explain to you what I mean by that. One of the first things that intelligent design argues is that it is necessary to explain what we see in the fossil record, that the fossil record is a problem of one sort for evolution. You might hear people say that the fossil record doesn't support evolution. Well, the National Academy of Sciences only a few years ago basically said, look, there are so many intermediate forms between all these species that it's often difficult to identify categorically where the transition occurs from one species to another. In other words, there's so many transitional forms, we actually argue about this. Christine Janis, a friend of mine at Brown, who's a paleontologist, um, I once asked Christine, you know, what about this uh, business of no transitional forms? And she said, are you kidding? I just came back from a meeting where there were 11 or 12 new fossils from the Powder River Basin in Wyoming were being introduced, and almost fistfights broke out among the scientists arguing as to whether or not these fossils should be called mammal-like reptiles or reptile-like mammals. If people are, if paleontologists are willing to argue about that, it tells you two things. One is paleontologists will argue about anything. And the second thing that it will tell you is that there are innumerable intermediate and transitional forms that we see in the fossil record. But I want to go a little bit further than, than this. Um, one of the arguments that has often been made against evolution is that the fossil record doesn't have the intermediates that it ought to. For example, we've known for a long time that whales and dolphins evolved from terrestrial mammals. There are unmistakable marks in their genetics and in their skeleton of this. But critics of evolution have said, oh, yeah? Well, you know, if they did, where are the intermediate forms? You know, put up or shut up. And in fact, I've even seen cartoons that looked a bit like this, ridiculing the notion that an intermediate could even exist between a land mammal and a swimming mammal. And the argument is that such animals would be so awkward on the land and so poor at swimming in the water that they really wouldn't be survivable. Well, the cartoons and the arguments started to disappear about 10 or 12 years ago when the very first skeletons of exactly such creatures were dug up. This is the skeleton of an organism which is now called Ambulocetus natans. And if your Latin is good, you'll know that Ambulocetus means the walking whale and natans means who swims. This is the walking whale who swims. It is a perfect intermediate form to plug right in the middle. So you might say, do we now have a true intermediate form? Not really. As it turns out, we have five intermediate forms that fill this gap, all discovered within the last two decades, precisely because paleontologists, when they found this guy, they figured out we know where to look. And where to look is in the Indus River Valley between India and Pakistan. That's where these creatures evolved, and that's where more intermediate fossils are found all the time. Okay, so do evolutionists say, yay, we've solved the problem, evolution is true, Darwin was right? No. Science is enormously self-critical. If this really happened, if this is a genuine evolutionary series, 
Do you know what has to have happened along with it? The middle ear has to have been completely changed. And the reason for that is the middle ear that a land mammal, like us, has, is very good for hearing in the air. If any of you have scuba dived or snorkeled, you know that your hearing stinks underwater. Your hearing is lousy. But the underwater hearing of these guys is sensational. It's so good they can use it as a form of sonar. That's because their middle ear structure is entirely different. So if this is real, we should be able to look at the middle ear structure of these fossils and see intermediate forms in which they're reshaped. And you know what? That's exactly what we see. This is a paper a year and a half ago from Nature dissecting a series of fossil skulls and showing exactly how the apparatus in the middle ear was remodeled through a whole series of intermediate forms to change from an apparatus that was good for hearing in the air to an apparatus that was intermediate to an apparatus that was terrific for hearing under the water. So the fossil record, the more we fill it in, the more complete it becomes and the more powerful it becomes as evidence for evolution. The second thing that you saw at the trial was that when data was introduced at the trial, which I and another witness introduced from whole genome sequencing, the intelligent design advocates just literally had nothing to say. We weren't asked questions in cross-examination. The other side never brought it up. They never argued against it. They just left it. Here's an example. Um, many of you may know that a few months ago, the genetic code of the chimpanzee was published. Therefore, we can compare our genome to these primate relatives. What do we find? I want to show you one striking finding that dates to about a year ago. You all know that evolution argues that we share a common ancestor with the great apes, the chimpanzee, the gorilla, and the orangutan. Well, if that's true, there should be genetic similarities, and in fact, there are. But there's something that's really interesting and has the potential, if it were true, to contradict evolutionary common ancestry. And that is, we have two fewer chromosomes than the other great apes. We have 46, they all have 48. That's very interesting. Now, what does that actually mean? Well, first of all, um, the 46 chromosomes that we have, you got 23 from mom and 23 from dad. So it's actually 23 pairs. These guys have 24 from each parent, so they have 24 pairs. So everybody in this room is missing a pair of chromosomes. Now, where did it go? Could it have gotten lost in our lineage? Uh-uh. If it got lost, if a whole primate chromosome was lost, that would be lethal. So there's only two possibilities. And that is, if these guys really share a common ancestor, that ancestor either had 48 chromosomes or 46. Now, if it had 48, 24 pairs, which is probably true, because three out of four have 48 chromosomes, what must have happened is that one pair of chromosomes must have gotten fused. So we should be able to look at our genome and discover that one of our chromosomes resulted from the fusion of two primate chromosomes. So we should be able to look around our genome. And you know what? If we don't find it, evolution is wrong. We don't share a common ancestor. So if, how would we find it? Well, biologists in the room will know that chromosomes have nifty little markers. They have markers called centromeres, which are DNA sequences that are used to separate them during mitosis. And they have cool little DNA sequences on the end called telomeres. What would happen if a pair of chromosomes got fused? Well, what would happen is the fusion would put telomeres where they don't belong in the center of the chromosome, and the resulting fused chromosome should actually have two centromeres. One of them might become inactivated, but nonetheless, it should still be there. So we can scan our genome, and you know what? If we don't find that chromosome, evolution's in trouble. Well, guess what? It's chromosome number two. Our chromosome number two was formed by the fusion of two primates.